Hello, everyone. Um, in the short time that we, we have, I wanted to, this year's theme for the Jobsfart Masterclass is, is consequences. So when I heard that, I was actually very intrigued and glad because that issue, consequences, is something that's been consuming my life, my professional my life, my work for the past 10 years, specifically uh, through my Intended Consequences project in Rwanda. So I thought <coughs> it would fit to speak with you about that in this short time and also really look at the work, but also look at how photography can be used for social change and how some photographers are becoming activists and trying to really uh, not only create awareness about an issue they're working on, but also directly helping the people that they photograph or communities they're interested in documenting. My project in Rwanda started in 2006 after a Newsweek assignment. Uh, I was there for a story relating to HIV AIDS and uh, we met a couple of uh, women that were raped during the Rwandan genocide. Um, during the Rwandan genocide, it's estimated that close to 400,000 women were raped, uh, aside from almost one million people being slaughtered by Hutu militias. And uh, following this interview that I sat in in that, in that initial trip to Rwanda with a woman named Margaret that described her whole family being <coughs> murdered in front of her, um, she was hiding under a bed, uh, when these militia men came into the house and murdered her family, uh, later captured by these men and taken to be a sex slave for about a month with another girl that lived next door. She was only 16 years old. She contracted HIV, AIDS, from these rapes, and that's really what the story that we were trying to focus on when we were there initially for Newsweek, uh, looking how HIV is, is used and was used, and specifically in the Rwandan genocide, as a weapon of war. But she also mentioned in passing that she became pregnant and had a baby boy, and that kind of haunted me. And, and, and I really, when I came back at the time, I lived in New York, and I came back to home, and I was just thinking about these children and about Margaret and about how many children like this are in Rwanda. I went back to Rwanda a couple months later just by my own accord. I just bought a ticket to Kigali and went there because I really wanted to investigate more this issue. And I found that there is an estimated 20,000 children they were born out of rapes during the Rwandan genocide, which like, just boggled my mind. And so basically a whole generation of children uh, that no one is really talking about. I never heard of this. I didn't see any reports relating to that, really. And I felt that there's a space there for me as a photographer uh, to go in there, investigate, and document the stories of these women, collect their testimonies, and photograph them. I chose to do it with portrait photography because, of course, it's an event that happened before, and I wanted to be able to somehow convey uh, their stories, uh, and I felt that photographing them with their children and portraits would be the best way to do it. Um, I want to just share with you a couple of small stories of some of these women, but I think it's very important to understand uh, the complexity and multi-level trauma that these women are going through today, many years after the genocide. So really, this is about the consequences of sexual violence, the consequences of war, the consequences of, of, of uh, genocide. So this is uh, Jocelyn that was, uh, in the first day of the genocide, militiamen came to her house. As soon as they opened the door, these militiamen murdered her husband in front of her. Um, and she was taken by these militia when she, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention, she was nine months pregnant uh, when the genocide started. So she's nine months pregnant. They murdered her husband, took her as a sex slave, basically, as they were escaping the liberation forces ended up in Congo in one of the refugee camps for, for several years. Uh, had the girl that you see in the back there, which is the daughter that was born from the husband, and later raped again and had another child that you see in the foreground. So she has two daughters that are less than one year apart, but one born from the husband, one born from these uh, rapists, from these militia men. So you can, you, you know, and she talks about how it, it, it's just so confusing for her. When she sees her older daughter, she thinks about her husband and how much she loved him and how much she loves her. And when she looks at this daughter, she only can think about these horrific experience, experiences that happened to her. Um, or Beatrice, that had two children at the time of the genocide and escaped to a local church, uh, thinking that she will be safe there, um, like a lot of other Tutsis in Rwanda that escaped the Hutu militias, found herself there with several thousand other people 
But for those militiamen, it was just a gift for all these people gathering together and just started slaughtering everybody to death with their machetes. She had to make an awful uh, decision because she was seeing everybody being killed and she saw an opportunity that she would be able to escape maybe, but she couldn't escape with two little kids. She felt that she wouldn't be fast enough to get to that place. And she had to choose one of her children to carry and let another child go. So she actually chose her older son, her firstborn, and was able, able to make a run for it and escape, but left that child behind to be killed. Later, was captured again, and unfortunately raped, and had this child that you see here. She also contracted HIV AIDS. This woman was beaten so hard that they had to amputate her leg. Of course, as Joyce mentioned, <laughs> Um, you know, today I spent this morning with the participants of the master class uh, going through this uh, project and the other, th the other things that uh, come with it for about an hour and 15 minutes. So it's a very short time. I can't tell you all the stories, but I wanted to just uh, also share with you just a short clip from a longer film that was made about this uh, project by MediaStorm. Uh, so you can hear a little bit of the testimonies of the women. So it's just a short clip that I cut for the purpose of this. After the genocide, I have many children that I look after. My brothers and sisters were all killed, but they had children who had survived. So I have seven children that I look after. My children, my orphans, my daughters, are my hope. They know I'm their everything. I'm their uncle, I'm their auntie, I'm their mother, I'm their father. I'm their grandmother. I am everything for them. So they don't want to hear that I am HIV positive. But that's the reality they have to live with. I am. I live with HIV, which is a legacy of genocide. I'm a mother, but unwilling to be a mother. Whenever I look at this child, I trigger back to the memories of rape. Maybe with time, I will love this daughter of mine. Maybe, but for now, no. This is not the way we used to live, but this is the way I am now. I am physically handicapped because of the beatings that I went through. I can't carry anything. It is now that I say it is even good that I didn't kill that boy because he fetches for me water. I don't think I'm a mother. I don't think I'm a girl. I'm something in between, something I don't know. Because a mother must have a home, I don't have a home. A girl doesn't have a child, I have a child. I don't think about Rwanda often. I think about my son. When I think about his life, he's like a tree without branches. He is my life. And if I didn't have him, I don't know what I would be. Tell the world that the international community has a debt because they didn't come to our rescue. They should now come to support us as we deal with the legacy of genocide. What message can I give you? All I see, it is morning, it is evening. A day has gone, another one has come. I didn't know I was pregnant until very late. That's when I started wishing to die and I thought I should commit suicide. I waited for the day to give birth and I would kill the child. But when I gave birth, the child was so beautiful that I developed love immediately. So obviously this project uh, affected me immensely. I, I, the more I photographed it, the more I visited Rwanda, the more families I met, the, the more I understood how much, you know, it, kind of the mission that I have <laughs> of, of communicating these stories to the world. And, 
uh, being able to provide some kind of space for their stories to be heard as they requested from me. Um, and I, I'm a firm believer that uh, photography does have the power to create social change and this is kind of the second part of what I want to talk about is what do we do now? How do we get this work out there? How do we try to, to help these people? And this is something I was struggling myself as I was getting <coughs> towards the end of the project. I say, a call for action, what does that mean? And I brought a few examples of things I did for this project that will, will demonstrate some of the effect that we can have through publishing this work and doing other things with the work. So the first publication that published this work was Stern Magazine in Germany. And uh, this is kind of just an example of the spread. That one of the spread, it was a 12, uh, 10 or 10, 12 pages spread with the testimonies of the women and the photographs. But I also asked them if they'd be willing to mention that we're trying to help these families and trying to raise some funds uh, to help for the, uh, with the education of the children. Because when I spoke with the women, they always, in the end of the interviews, when I asked them about their future and the children's future, they always expressed how much they would like their children to be able to stay in school and develop the skills so they could provide for themselves in the future. And I thought that that's quite amazing, you know, from all the, in addition to everything else they're going through and having extreme poverty, they do understand the value of the education for their children. And, that's, and we put that there, but you know, you know, so a quarter of a million euros was donated from the German population alone after this article was published. This is from one article, people read the stories, looked at the images, but because there was this, they immediately had a way to take action. If this would not be there, I'd say probably most of them, 95% of them would not make the effort to go and look for something for some kind of research how they can help. And this is something I'm very much, uh, you know, I advocate with my uh, friends, my photographer, photographers I know, and if I teach, I talk about this because I feel it's really important. And the Telegraph magazine published it next, a week after. And again, a small call for action saying this is how you can help. Here's the website. Boom, 75,000 pounds. In two weeks, we have 350,000 euros that is sent to try to help these people. This is a call for action. And which of course I didn't know what to do with and I had no plan and it was quite, quite uh, surprising in fact that it happened, but it happened. But it helped us uh, start Foundation Rwanda, a foundation I, I founded, I co-founded, uh, that uh, supports the education for children born out of rape in Rwanda, uh, provides the women that you saw with uh, psychological help, uh, some therapy, helping them uh, teach them some skills so they can uh, have some income-generating uh, income activities. Um, to date, we supported, we're, we're supporting up to 850 children in Rwanda, raised over two and a half million dollars uh, from the time we started until today. Uh, so this is kind of an example of how we can, in this short time to talk of it, how a call for action can really have impact uh, and actually serve as a vehicle for people to try to come and help and donate money. Just shortly, I want to say again, I mean, I didn't, I mean, it's not like I invented the wheel. These kind of effects that photography has is not a new thing. This is a photo essay published in Life magazine 1951 by Eugene Smith uh, about a black nurse, a midwife uh, in the Deep South. It's the first time Life magazine ever published a story, a heroic story about a black person. So it was quite kind of an original thing that happened, but the readers saw the pictures, read the stories, saw the conditions in which this amazing woman is operating, and at the time sent $27,000, which today would probably be hundreds of thousands of dollars, to try and to help to build a new clinic for this midwife. Stephanie Sinclair, con some contemporary photographers that are doing, there's a lot actually today that are doing great stuff and trying to do something uh, with the project that they work on that's been working on the Too Young to Wed project, dealing with early child marriage, uh, started her own foundation that not only with the money they collect supports funds for sending other photographers out to the world to document stories relating to that, to try to create awareness about this and change this practice, but also change policy within some of these countries and villages with the leaders, with the chiefs of the villages to try to change uh, that practice and you know, help not marry these young girls. And lastly, uh, Brent Sturton, that 
through his work, was able, they were able to raise millions of dollars for conservation to try to help to prevent, prevent uh, poaching, ivory poaching and mainly uh, rhino horn poaching. And in fact, also he personally even supported the university uh, fees for these two rangers that risk their life every day. So I'll end here. Um, thank you very much. And um, you know, I hope I could have done more and show you more from, from this, but uh, we'll end it there. Thank you.